Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Marcus Schranker? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Marcus Schrenker was born on November 27, 1970, and grew up in Merrillville, Indiana. In the summer of 1993, when Marcus was in college, he met a woman named Michelle. The couple became romantically involved. On the first date, Marcus took Michelle for a ride in his airplane. The couple married on October 7, 1995, and would go on to have three children over the next several years. Marcus took a job as a financial planner, Essentially, he was a salesperson. Eventually, he combined his interest in aviation with his career and started focusing on commercial pilots, believing he would have more success if he concentrated his efforts on a high-income group. Marcus eventually started three financial companies of his own and managed retirement funds for several clients, including family members, friends, and, of course, commercial pilots. Marcus told his clients he was investing their money in a foreign currency fund, but he wasn't actually doing that. Instead, he cheated his clients out of millions of dollars. He moved the money from one annuity to the next and accrued substantial commissions. This left his clients facing massive surrender fees. This behavior led to many complaints and lawsuits against Marcus over the years. Crime appeared to be paying off for Marcus, at least in the beginning, his family lived in an upscale suburb of Indianapolis called Geist. They had a 10,000-square-foot, $3 million mansion on a lake. In addition, Marcus owned a Piper Maladu Meridian PA46500TP. This is a single-engine turboprop aircraft with a maximum takeoff weight of 5,000 pounds that can hold one pilot and five passengers. The Piper was worth over a million dollars. It was stored at a nearby airport in Anderson, Indiana. In December of 2007, Michelle thought that Marcus may be having an affair. She looked through his phone records and found a number he called frequently. It belonged to a woman who worked at the airport where the aircraft was stored. After confronting Marcus, he eventually admitted he was having an affair. He promised to stop, but continued cheating anyway, at least according to Michelle. About a year later, on December 30, 2008, Michelle filed for divorce. The next day, the authorities raided the family mansion as part of a criminal investigation into Marcus. In addition to these criminal problems, Marcus was facing at least eight civil lawsuits. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On January 8, 2009, Marcus used his computer to search the internet for several different terms, including how to jump out of the airplane when parachuting, how to open a parachute, parachuting safety, how to calculate the drop zone when skydiving, explosive decompression, requirements to get a Florida driver's license, Florida birth certificate, and securities fraud penalties. Based on these searches, it is difficult to know exactly what Marcus was up to, but it appeared as though Florida was going to have an unexpected visitor. Two days later, on January 10, 2009, Marcus departed in his pickup truck, towing a trailer containing his Yamaha motorcycle. He went to a public storage facility in Harpersville, Alabama, where he stored the motorcycle using the name of his half-brother. Marcus then drove back to Indiana. On the next day, January 11, Marcus drove to the airfield in Anderson, Indiana, and climbed into his Piper turboprop. At about 6.45 p.m., Marcus took off. His destination was supposed to be Destin, Florida, which sits on the Gulf of Mexico. At about 8.20 p.m., when he was near Birmingham, Alabama, and flying at about 24,000 feet, Marcus initiated a series of contacts with air traffic control, where he pretended to be having problems with his windshield. Eventually, he told them that his windshield had failed, and he was bleeding profusely. At 8.34 p.m., he descended to 3,500 feet. He then made course corrections to get close to Harpersville, Alabama, where his motorcycle was in storage. 
he activated the autopilot with the intent of the plane reaching the Gulf of Mexico before crashing from fuel exhaustion. He believed that no one would find the aircraft. Marcus then jumped out of the plane wearing a parachute. Two F-15 fighters were sent to intercept the aircraft and found it still flying. The pilots noticed that the windshield was intact, the door was open, and the cockpit was dark and empty. They continued to follow the aircraft. At 9.20 p.m., after traveling 200 miles, it crashed into a wooded area north of Milton, Florida, just a few miles short of the Gulf of Mexico. Investigators examined the wreckage of the aircraft and found there was no blood in the cockpit. There were two books in the aircraft, a campground directory and a map of all 50 states. Both books were missing sections that covered Alabama and Florida. Inside the back cover for one of the books, handwritten notes were identified. They contained statements including windshield spider cracking, coming down, doors open, window is in neck and chest, bleeding very bad, and graying out. After jumping out of his aircraft, Marcus parachuted to the ground. He landed in Childersburg, Alabama. He approached a homeowner and claimed that he and some friends had been in a canoeing accident. The homeowner contacted the police in order to help Marcus. The officer who responded eventually took him to a hotel in Harpersville, where Marcus checked in using his half-brother's name. After staying in the room briefly, Marcus walked to the storage facility and retrieved his motorcycle. He drove to a campground in Gadsden County, Florida, where he used cash to purchase a tent site. He sent an email to a neighbor stating that the airplane crash was a misunderstanding. Sending this email allowed the authorities to get a rough idea of where Marcus was. The local police contacted the owners of the campground and asked them if they had seen anything out of the ordinary lately. Referring to Marcus, the owners talked about a suspicious camper. On January 13, Marcus was arrested at the campground. He had self-inflicted wounds on his wrists. Marcus recovered after being treated at a hospital. On June 5, 2009, Marcus Schrenker pleaded guilty to willful damage, destruction, or wreckage of an aircraft and knowingly and willfully communicating a false distress message to the United States Coast Guard. He was sentenced to four years and three months in prison. By August of 2010, all his possessions had been sold, and he was facing about $20 million in civil claims. On October 7, 2010, Marcus pleaded guilty to five counts of securities fraud and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. At his sentencing, he said, quote, I let my assets control me, unquote. Marcus was transferred to a halfway house in 2014 and released in 2015. Reportedly, he lives near Pensacola, Florida. His wife, Michelle, was never charged with a crime due to the financial problems that were caused by the activities of Marcus. Michelle had to move out of the mansion and find a job. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. During the time Marcus was married, various reports indicated that he had mood swings, anger problems, and was excitement-seeking. Image was extremely important to Marcus. He wanted everything to be perfect, and he wanted to have the best of everything. For example, he liked expensive suits. At one point, he even had a photo taken as he and his wife stood in front of a Lexus sedan and his Piper turboprop. Marcus was reckless with money, in addition to cheating clients out of millions of dollars, he filed for bankruptcy in 1991 and in 2003. One person who knew Marcus described him as having two personalities, the person that he knew and the person he read about in the news. Marcus was self-centered, manipulative, charismatic, deceptive, grandiose, had a sense of entitlement, and lacked empathy. People said that Marcus was an incredible salesperson. He sounded like he knew what he was talking about. Many people never doubted him, even for a second. His personality traits and behavior are consistent with being a con artist. Item number two. During court proceedings, Marcus suggested that he had mental health problems. He appeared to be hopeful that these alleged problems would reduce his sentence. Marcus claimed that in 1991, 
he was officially diagnosed with bipolar access to and depression. I don't know if Marcus made this up or how he arrived at this diagnosis, but it doesn't make any sense for a few reasons. Bipolar disorder and major depressive disorder are major mood disorders and both contain a depression component. A person cannot be diagnosed with both disorders at the same time. As far as his claim about access to being involved, that is a reference to the old multiaxial system used in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Access to comprised the 10 personality disorders, whereas access one comprised all the other mental disorders. A person would never be diagnosed as access two. Rather, a clinician would specify which personality disorder or disorders an individual had. Regardless of the credibility of this diagnosis, Marcus never disclosed a mental health diagnosis of any type in even one of the eight airmen's medical examinations he had between 1992 and 2007. If he is making up a diagnosis anyway, perhaps he should have selected fear of prison-induced illness fabrication disorder. Item number three, some people have suggested that Marcus was a pathological liar by pointing out the vast quantity of evidence available to support this conclusion. I don't know if he is a pathological liar or not, but he was certainly fond of deception. Here are just a few examples. Marcus told stories about being in the Air Force and flying in combat. He claimed that he had training at NASA. On the day of his mid-flight plane exit, he told someone he was going into the witness protection program. After being arrested, he told his stepmother he lost part of his arm when he jumped from the aircraft. A few months later, he told his father that he was hypnotized at the Miami Federal Detention Center. And during an interview with Good Morning America, Marcus claimed he suffered from hypoxia from flying at 3,500 feet. Hypoxia does not occur below 10,000 feet. Marcus pretty much lied all the time. Many of his lies did not help him with making money, like the ones where he bragged about things he didn't do. He would have been able to defraud more effectively by telling the truth once in a while. If Marcus was a pathological liar, his motive may have been based on narcissism. Some lies were told to make money, and others were for sympathy, but I think many of his lies were to convince people he was great. Perhaps he was telling lies that he wanted to be true. In general, Pathological lying is strongly associated with all four cluster B personality disorders, antisocial, narcissistic, borderline, and histrionic. Item number four, what do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Marcus had personality traits consistent with frequent deception, and he was a con artist. He was able to convince people to hand him large amounts of money. For years, he took millions of dollars from innocent victims and enjoyed the good life but eventually he knew that he was going to be arrested. Marcus came up with a plan to stage his own death and start a new life in Florida. He was also perfectly willing to no longer be alive if that became necessary to remain prison free. His attitude was that he was going to get what he wanted or he was no longer going to play the game. When Marcus realized the authorities were closing in on him, he demonstrated his determination to avoid responsibility by causing serious injuries to himself. Ultimately, he survived and ended up in prison, but was released after only a few years. A trail of destruction was left behind Marcus, including shattered retirement dreams for some of his clients. They paid the price for his self-centeredness and grandiosity. Now moving to my final thoughts. The case of Marcus Schrenker can be summarized in this way. A man named Marcus from Merrillville married a maiden named Michelle, worked as a money manager, and moved into a marvelous mansion. His moral compass malfunctioned, and he misappropriated money. Despite his masterful manipulation, he muddled into messy legal matters. Motivated to move on, he manufactured a morbid maneuver, a mid-air mishap masking his mortal demise. After meeting misfortune, he meandered into a minimal sentence and could maintain his mendacious million lie mission. Those are my thoughts on the case of Marcus Schrenker. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.